Spirit, one God, amen. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Cross, and these readings supersede any of the normal Sunday readings of Great Lent. We celebrate the Feast of the Cross two times of the year, um, the 10th of Banam Hat, which is today, the 19th of March, uh, for one day, and then the 17th of Tut, which is lasts for three days. That's around the September time. Um, and we notice that there's a similar kind of feeling to Palm Sunday. There's uh, the tunes, the procession, um, the theme. And so this gospel passage that taken, that's taken from today is taken from the gospel of St. John chapter 10. And something else happens earlier in John chapter 10 that I think is noteworthy. Uh, in the verse 11 of the gospel of St. John chapter 10, verse 11, our Lord says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. And then, and then we have the passage of today, right? Passage of today we take from uh, verses 22 to 38. And then he says something else about sheep, and I think it's noteworthy. He says in verse 26, but, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, and in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. What does it mean to follow him? What is his voice saying? Right? He's saying what? That my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So what's the voice of God telling us? Did we notice what was read in the epistle reading today? In the book of uh, uh, 1 Peter. What does St. Peter say? What did the voice of God say? He said in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We follow the shepherd. We follow his steps. And it goes on to say in verse 25, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. For a moment, I want you to think of Christ going to the crucifixion, going to the cross, going to the way of suffering. On the way to the cross, do you think Christ ever said, I don't deserve this. I'm God. I'm whole. I'm perfect. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't deserve this. On the way to the cross, do you think Christ ever said, these sinners... These people, they don't deserve this. They don't deserve what I'm doing for them. They're not worth it. On the way to the cross, while people were cursing him and spitting on him and abusing him and mocking him, do you think he said, I have to set them straight? If I don't put a stop to this, nobody else will. On the way to the cross, do you think that our Lord Jesus Christ said, man, I really just want to put up my feet in my couch, have a nice drink, a nice TV show, hamburger. I just want to relax. I just want some comfort. Do you believe that Christ ever thought any of those things? When another person mistreats us, and I'm not just talking about a random person that you find at the, you know, at a store or out in the world somewhere. And that counts too, but I'm talking about those people who are closest to us. A parent, a child, a husband, a wife, anybody that really is in our inner circle, that really matters. If someone mistreats us, at what point do we say, I'm not putting up with this anymore? Why are we often unwilling to obey the command that was given by God, his voice, in 1 Peter chapter 2, to patiently bear suffering and not to fight back? I think in most cases it comes down to four things. I'm going to unpack these four things. I'm going to say them out loud and we'll unpack them. The first one, we think we don't deserve this. We put up for it with a little while and then we're done. And we're not willing to put up with it anymore. And the reason we give is, I don't deserve this. In other words, I am, 
I am beyond this. I am so good. I don't deserve, I, I deserve to be treated better than this. Okay, that's the first point. We'll unpack these one of these. The second point is we think that you don't deserve this. In other words, we put up with it for a while, but finally we're done. And our reason is you don't deserve this. The other person is, is undeserving of the patience and respect that you give them. Are you following? The third point is, if I don't put a stop to this, nobody else will. In other words, justice depends on me. I have to put justice into my own hands. The fourth point is, I don't feel, I don't like the way this feels. I don't like the way this feels. In other words, I want personal comfort at all costs. So let's look at these four. These four reasons why we refuse to endure suffering. The first point is I don't deserve this. And the first reason is I feel like I deserve to be treated better than this way. Like if I were a rotten kid, then of course I should be forced to listen to my parents. It makes sense. But no, I'm a good person, so I shouldn't have to put up with this. If I were an evil wife, then I would need to learn submission. But no, I'm a good wife. I'm nice to my husband, so I shouldn't have to put up with any of this from him. If I were a lazy employee, then of course I would have to learn obedience to my boss. But, but you know what? I'm a good employee. I'm a good worker, so I shouldn't have to put up with any of this. Did our Lord Jesus Christ deserve what he suffered? Did he deserve what he suffered? Absolutely not. Yet when he received verbal abuse, did he open his mouth in anger? Did he respond? When he suffered, he did not respond by threatening anyone. He patiently endured the verbal abuse, the physical suffering. And in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10, our Lord says, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He was willing to endure suffering and death because, frankly, he loves us. So when somebody mistreats us, why do we lash out in anger? Why do we return evil for evil? The second point, you don't deserve this. In other words, the other person is undeserving of the patience and respect that I should give them. They don't deserve. They haven't earned that. We imagine that we would obey this command under better circumstances. In other words, if my parents treated me better, then sure, I would honor and obey them. If my husband was more respectable, then I would listen to him. If my boss was more reasonable, then I would patiently listen to him or her. Yet, what does God say about the other person and how you should respond to the other person? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we read, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition and conceit, or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. If you think that you're better than your parents, if you think that you're better than your spouse, if you think that you're better than your kids, if you think that you're better than your boss, you've already disobeyed this. You are commanded by God to be lowly in your thinking, not just in your words, but in your actions. Be lowly in your thinking. We are sometimes good at putting on a show. I think we have learned how, how well humility works socially. With our actions, sometimes we're very humble. I know we, we pat our chest and we look down and we say, go ahead of me a communion. We're, we're very humble. But in our minds, I think that we're still thinking, like, you know, I'm upset with you. I'm better than you. You don't deserve my respect. And as scripture says, out of the, tre out of the treasures of the heart, the mouth speaks. Eventually, you can't keep it back anymore, and it just comes out. Something triggers you. And you ask yourself, where did that venom come from? Well, it was in our hearts, and then it finally came out. 
God says, in your heart, in your thoughts, in your mind, in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You think of yourself last. When you think of your husband, think of him as being better than you. When you think of your wife, think of her as being better than you. When you think of your parents, think of them as being better than you. When you think of your boss, think of him as better than you. You say, I can't do that. You can't obey God? Stop saying that you can't and start asking, Lord, have mercy on me. How can I do this? And he will answer. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we read, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Giving preference to one another. Giving preference to one another. If it's between you and that other person, you give preference to them. But I've already done that, Abuna. I've done that 10 times already. Good, do it 11. But I've given preference to the other person 700 times. Good, 701. Christ went all the way to the cross. And who in this room has gone that far? We are his sheep. We follow him. We follow him to the cross. The other person, the one that you despise or the one that is unworthy of your respect, that person is created in the image of God. And I think it's safe to say that no one in this room would dare spit in the face of Christ. Let's take it down a notch. Look at the icons in the room. I pray that no one would ever dare spit on an icon. But what do the icons represent? They are the image of Christ in their own unique way. Sometimes literally, sometimes through the, the story of the saints. But they are Christ. Would you spit on an icon? Hope not. So we, we, do, we do not want to go that far. We don't want to be able to say that we despise a person who is created in his image and his likeness. We have to work on this. Leviticus 19, verse 18 commands, love your neighbor as yourself. And then we say, but you don't understand. This isn't my neighbor. This is my spouse. This is my boss. This, is, this person is so messed up that this person is my enemy. Guess what our Lord says that we're supposed to do with our enemies? Love them. In 1 Peter chapter 3, what did St. Peter tell us? In verses 8 and 9, it says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessings. Knowing that you were called to this, that you might inherit a blessing. Even when they give the ultimate insult and crucify him as a common criminal, murdering him, the innocent. His response is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There are things that could arouse the wrath and anger of Christ, but he himself, being personally attacked, was not one of them. He did not respond in anger just because people attacked him. Think about it. Our Lord Christ patiently suffered all of this for the deserving or the undeserving. He didn't go through all of that because we deserve to have God die for us. We don't deserve it at all. I know I don't. He endured it anyway because he loves us. He calls us to follow his example and to show love to one another, deserving or not. The third point. If I don't put a stop to this, nobody else will. When somebody mistreats us and speaks in, at us in anger, why do we lash out in anger? We say, I don't deserve this. We say, you don't deserve uh, this patience. You're not worthy of that patience that I should give you. So the third reason is, if I don't put a stop to this, nobody else will. Right? Justice is, depends on me. 
We've been watching too many, too many Marvel movies. We feel like justice is dependent on me. We imagine that justice depends on us and that we alone can carry it out. We imagine ourselves as knights in shining armor, battling the forces of evil. We imagine that we would patiently endure suffering, except for the fact that it wouldn't do any good in this case. We imagine that if we could keep our mouths shut and, and patiently endure suffering, then that bad guy is going to get away with it. We convince ourselves that we are lashing out against the other person, not because of selfishness, but because of a desire to do good. When we read in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17, it says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceable among with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will reap coals of fire on his head. Do not become, uh, do not overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As we read in the epistle today, in 1 Peter chapter 2, our Lord sets the example. He did not revile back. He did not threaten back. He committed himself. He had no worries that justice would fail to be done. Where is our faith? Our Lord trusted his Father to take care of all things in the right time. Where is our faith? The fourth point. I don't like the way this feels. There's a group of people that will lash out back with, from verbal abuse with anger. It has nothing to do with any of these first three reasons. They're not thinking through all of this stuff. They're not even saying, I don't deserve this. They're not thinking, you don't deserve for me to respond nicely. They're not even thinking about justice. And if I don't put a stop to this, nobody else will. They're not thinking of any of that. The last group of people, and I think this is the most challenging group of all, they say, I just don't like the way this feels. It hurts, and I, and I, and I personally want comfort now at all costs. It's not that they think about how their actions are going to hurt their spouse or they're intentionally thinking about how they're going to, you know, chastise their kids or how their actions are going to hurt the church or their family. It doesn't even cross their mind. They don't think about it at all. All they think about is their own suffering and their own pain. And how can I stop it right now? I want comfort right now. Nothing else matters. It doesn't even take the other person into account. In this case, you lash out in anger simply because you want to avoid pain at all costs. You seek your own personal comfort without taking time to think about what God commands and without thinking about how the, the words that you speak will affect the other person. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of, of others. There are many people in this world who have been deceived into thinking they are good people, and you ask them, how often do you plot evil things against your spouse? That person will honestly say, never. I never plot anything against my spouse. I don't want to hurt them. I hope. So, okay, how often do you plot self-centered and vile things against your kids or against your parents? And this person will say, never. I don't want anything bad to happen to my parents. I don't want anything bad to happen to my kids. Okay, so how often do you plan to do wicked things to your boss or your coworkers? Never, because this person, truly from their heart, never makes evil plans for other people. This is true. They never plan 
for wicked things to happen to other people. They think they're good. They think they're righteous. Yet they are violating this command. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, there are some people that don't plan any evil thing. They're, they're not cognizant of that. They don't plan for any evil thing to happen to someone else. The problem is they don't think about anybody else at all. This is the most challenging case. They just don't think about anybody else at all. All of their thoughts are simply on what's going to make me happy today. I hurt. How can I stop that pain? Here is something I want to do. Here is something that would give me pleasure. Oh, this would be a lot of fun. And 24-7, every waking moment of every day, all we think about is ourselves. They don't have any time of the day to think evil thoughts about anybody else. They didn't go that far. They don't think about any thoughts about them at all. Not even evil, fine. That's good level. But they don't even think about anybody at all. How they're own self-centered actions hurt and affect other people doesn't even enter their minds. They just don't care. This was a problem with the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man, it wasn't that he was like vile to Lazarus. It wasn't that he was like evil towards Lazarus. He just didn't even see him. He didn't even pay attention to him. He didn't even notice that he was alive. Even though he was begging at his gate. So to conclude, don't ask whether you have recently thought some evil thoughts about someone else and ask, we have to ask these questions to ourselves. When is the last time I put my own wants and my own desires and sufferings on the back burner and said, how can I really bless my spouse today? Again, how can I really bless my kids today? How could I show honor to my parents, no matter what age? We have to push every thought of self on the back burner. And we focus on another human being. We have to ask ourselves, how can I serve that person? How can I love that person? How can I show that person honor and respect and show that person that they are valued? When is the last time we did that? If you are a follower of Christ, if you are of his flock, you are part of his sheep, you consider him your shepherd, we should do it every hour of every day. Think about it. Our Lord patiently endured suffering to go to the cross because he was trying to seek his own personal comfort? No. Christ is our example. He patiently endured the sufferings even though he deserved to be treated better. He alone, I could say that statement for, that he deserved to be treated better. He patiently endured verbal abuse and suffering to help us even though we do not deserve to be helped. Our Lord Jesus Christ patiently endured verbal abuse and suffering and he left justice in the hands of God, Father, trusting him to judge righteously. He did not seek his own personal comfort. We say that we want to be like Christ. We say that we want to be of his flock. We want him to be our shepherd. We want to hear his voice. Do we really mean it? Are we really willing to follow his example? And glory be to God forever. Amen. For grace.